So now we looked at three regions, right? Anode fall zone, cathode fall zone, and third one, arc column. See so in that the anode fall zone and cathode fall zone, which are there just above both anode and cathode, very tiny, extremely tiny. If you make that bigger, these zones if they expand, then you have a serious problem on arc stability because obviously if a voltage changes dramatically, then you have a problem of energy gain, right. So generally in a stable arc condition, the anode fall zone is very thin, 10 power minus 7 meters, extremely few microns, okay. So between the cold anode and arc hot arc column, okay. And this region is characterized by the presence of electrons, the negative space carriers, energy carriers. And because this anode is positive, right, so there you, you would not expect a positive ion sticking to the positive terminal because of repulsion. So the anode fall zone is always characterized by the accumulation of negative space charges, the lack of positive ions. The voltage drop is somewhere between 1 to 10 volts. Again, if it goes more than that, then it is not sustained, right? And you have a problem again. And there is no thermal equilibrium because if you want to have a thermal equilibrium, okay, so you need to have a collisions between the electrons and ions, which should be giving an equivalent energy transfer. Okay. Suppose if you do not have an adequate number of, in this case uh, ions, so there will not be collision, adequate collision to make both ion temperature and electron temperature equal, is not it? Because you have a large number of negative space carriers, charges, electrons. So then electrons, electrons will even collide, you will not get an equilibrium because the ion temperature in this case will be much, much lower than the electron temperature because there is no real equilibrium transfer, it is clear. So there is no thermal equilibrium at this region where because of the accumulation of electrons, the electron temperature will be much, much higher than the, the ion temperature in anode fall zone, okay. So that is what I have written here the exchange of energy is incomplete, okay, because you are acc accumulating the electrons here and due to that the electron temperature will be much, much higher if any ion present in the vicinity, the ionic temperature will be much lower because there is no energy exchange between the electrons because you have only electrons, yes, it is clear anode fall zone. The next fall zone is extremely important, the cathode fall zone because the cathode acts as an electron emitter, okay. If, if you do not emit electrons, there is no discharge, is not it? So similar to the anode fall zone, cathode fall zone also is very tiny, 10 power minus 8 between the arc column and the cold cathode, whereas in here you have a positive accumulation of the, the accumulation of positive ions, which is negative terminal, right? So you have surplus positive ions. The voltage drop is slightly higher than the, the anode fall zone, but it is about 10 to 15. Again here also no thermal equilibrium, is not it? Because you have only accumulation of ions. That means that the energy exchange is incomplete. But whereas in this case, the electron temperature will be much, much lower than the gas temperature, okay. So the gas temperature will be higher than, gas means here the ions, gas ions. The gas ion temperature will be higher than the electron temperature because the energy exchange is not possible because you have only accumulation of ions. Isn't it? 
the function of cathode is extremely important in welding case because cathode emits electrons. So, if you do not emit electrons, how do you discharge? How do you discharge an, an, a gas atom? The electron first interact, knocks the other electron out from the gas atom and you have a generation of positive ion and the avalanche happens. So, the discharge is sustained. Okay. So, the main function of cathode is to emit electrons. Okay. It is very important. So, the, the function of cathode is extremely important because that is where you emit electrons. So, once you emit obviously it will travel to the electron will travel to the anode, but during this process it will also interact with the medium gas causing some more emissions the avalanche the discharge. Okay. So, how do you emit? The, what are the mechanism behind the electron emission? By thermionic emissions. Okay. So, that is one type of uh, emissions where you can emit electron from a material thermionic emissions. Okay. That is good. So, how do you uh, how does thermionic, thermionic emission work? You heating you heat up, you heat electrode to high temperature. Okay. So, then the electrons are emitted and that is determined by the, the work you need to emit or knock an electron out from a material okay, that is nothing but work function. Okay. So, the main mechanism behind the electron emission is thermionic emission, but thermionic emission alone will not give you the electrons there is another emission field emission. Okay. The field emission can also give the sustained electron emission, but both combined would generate electrons needed for discharge. Okay. So, in thermionic emission we heat up the cathode, we heat up the cathode to higher temperature based on the work function whether you, you emit an electron or suppose if work function is very high, so you need to increase the temperature much further that is determined by this beautiful equation Richardson Deutschmann equation, it is not Dussmann, uh, it is a Deutschmann. Okay. So, Richardson Deutschmann equation, so where you see the current density or electron density emitted from a cathode is determined by there are two important factors here right, T what is that? Temperature and then this guy, okay. E times 5, so that is work function, okay. So, this is in the charge of an electron over potential difference, it is electron volt E V, okay. So, that is work function. See if you multiply it by electron the, which is nothing but the ampere right, the, the electron density, the charge multiplied by volt what, what does it mean? V i, V i means? V i means the energy is not it, the electron volt that is a basic. So, that means that the work you do to emit an electron okay, that is work function is not it. So, this is defined by E V electron volt okay. So, that means that the work you should do to emit an electron from the material okay, that is work function and if you look at this equation and you have a T square that is temperature that means that when temperature increases, so obviously you emit more electrons leading to increasing in current density that means that electron density increases. Okay. And this guy the E phi or E V electron volt it is a material parameter, okay. how good the electrons are all bonded or in the 
the atomic configuration. So, generally material which has higher melting point would also have a high work function okay. And if you want to have a thermionic emission you need to increase the temperature to higher temperatures then only you would have a thermionic emission right. But now we have a problem because if you want to keep an electrode for example if you want to make a non consumable electrode that electrode should have a high melting point so that you can increase the temperature and then you can emit electrons is not it. So now it is difficult so to emit an electron by thermionic emission right. So what do we do? We add some oxides okay. So when we use a non consumable electrode in welding the material the alloys would be having high melting point but then if you have high melting point you will also have a high work function. So if you add if you dope the, the material with high melting point with oxides okay. So then we can promote thermionic emission yes. So if you use a high melting alloy most commonly used uh, a non consumable electrode is tungsten. So it is not pure tungsten when you do a welding we always dope with oxides okay. So most commonly used uh, the oxide dopant when I was doing my PhD was thorium, thorium oxide but thorium oxide is radioactive okay. So nowadays you, you cannot buy thoriated tungsten electrode because it is banned but that is fantastic the electrode stability of thoriated electrode is very nice unfortunately thorium oxide is radioactive. So it is replaced with cerium oxide okay. So these are all rare earth oxides which have extremely low electron uh, the work function. So we dope the high melting alloys with these oxides so that we can emit the electrons by thermionic emission okay. So, so the, the equation defines the, the amount of electrons emitted as a function of temperature and the work function. You can use richardson Duesmann equation to calculate. For example, if I give you a work function of a material and a material constant A, you can always calculate what will be the amount of electrons or density of electrons emitted by the material at a given temperature. Yes, you can calculate right. So if you dope it with oxides, the oxides are very low work function which is beneficial. So what do we do generally? So if you look at the electron volts, so nickel has slightly higher electron volts than tungsten but melting point is lower than tungsten. So we cannot use nickel as a non consumable electrode because it will melt by the time you induce a thermionic emission. So if you use tungsten the, the work function is reasonably okay and you can heat it up to higher temperature so that you can induce a thermionic emission. So that is why tungsten electrodes are commonly used as an electron source okay in SEM okay or cathode or tubes CRTs okay when you have electron gun tungsten is commonly used right because of this fact that it is high melting and electron volts the work function is reasonably okay. So you can work with tungsten to emit electrons. So in order to increase the efficiency of thermionic emission we also dope tungsten with oxides. So oxides electron volt somewhere between 2 to 3 electron volt. Suppose if you have a, a tungsten electrode and you dope it with oxide, so obviously whenever there is an oxide and if a temperature is increased this oxide would start emitting electrons by thermionic emissions and because of that there will be electron emission locally in the oxides and they can travel to the tungsten obviously then locally and they would knock out further electrons from the tungsten orbitals and then you will have 
a sustained emission of electrons from the cathode. Right? So, the most commonly used the oxide dopant for tungsten is thorium oxide and nowadays uh, we also use cerium oxide dopants and we will look at in detail when we look at the uh, gas tungsten arc welding in chapter 2, what are the oxides, what are the functions of the oxides. Right now we can assume that the work function is extremely important. So, thermionic emission is happens because of the high temperature when you heat it up obviously electrons go out when you supply energy equal to the work function the electron can be knocked out right it's clear and we need to have reasonably high temperature therefore we use high melting high temperature melting alloys where we have a doping of oxide leading to an efficient thermionic emission because of the oxides have a low work function clear ok. So, the thermionic emission alone cannot give sustained electron emission needed for the arc discharge ok. For example, if you use consumable welding process not tungsten you use an uh, say steel filler you want to strike an arc you cannot expect a thermionic emission from a steel wire is not it. Then how do we sustain the electron emission? So then, so you need to use a field emission as your main source. For example, low melting alloys for steels, and you want to do on a GMAW, gas metal arc welding. So then, if you make one of them cathode, either your steel wire or a steel substrate, so obviously you need to generate electron right from the cathode otherwise you cannot strike an arc you cannot make a discharge. So, in that case thermionic emission may not be sufficient. So, the main the electron generation mechanism in that case is field emission ok, but the field emission if you want to have you need to have a very high current density amperage ok. So, we ignite the arc by the high density current density so that we can also cause a field emission yes over your question yeah so the field emission is helpful when you want to use a low melting cathodes because thermionic emission is not providing enough electrons needed for the discharge ok. The, the phenomena of field emission is extremely complex generally happens because of the electron tunneling ok, but the principle behind it is the electrons are tunneled and then it comes out of the surface because of the, the high energy density ok. So, you maintain by the field emission. So, you do not need a, a, a high melting alloy, but you need to have very high electric field to promote the field emission yes it is clear. So, the, the function of cathode is to emit electrons, the cathode emits electrons by two ways so one is thermionic emission the other one is field emission ok. The thermionic emission happens when you heat up a material to higher temperature and if the energy the heat is sufficient to knock an electron based on its work function then the electron will be emitted from the material ok. The amount of electrons emitted by thermal emission it can be calculated using Richardson Richardson-Dusman equation as a function of temperature because all other things are constant in that equation right. Okay, the work function is constant, material constant. Only variable there is the temperature. With the temperature, you can calculate. So, what will be the current density of your electrons? Right. So, second phenomena, which also enhances the electron emission, is field emission. So, field emission is widely used, or field emission is the rate controlling 
when you have a low melting cathodes. Okay? So low melting cathodes also needs a high electric field to emit electrons by field emission. Right? So the field emission governs the electron emissions in the low melting cathodes. It's clear? Okay, so the two fault zones we have seen now. Anode fault zone, the anode is mostly dormant. Okay? So anode function is to have a potential cause of potential difference to charge carrier so that charge carriers can travel. But the cathode determines the density of charge carriers. Okay? The cathode emits electrons. So if you want to sustain the arc, that means that you need to supply the charge carrier. right? If you switch off the power source, what happens? You also stop the charge carriers. right? So then there will not be any more thermionic emissions. So when you pass an electron, obviously the electron, the electrode is also heats up by resistance heating, the temperature increases. Yes? clear? So two emissions. Okay. So now we will go to the important zone, okay, arc column. Right? So with the, whatever happens in arc column determines the heat generation. Right? It's clear? So it's beautiful, the arc column, right? It's very bright. So what will be the temperature of this guy, the bright region? More than 10,000. How, how more than 10,000? <laughs> yeah, how much more than 10,000? 5,000 more than 10,000? Uh -huh. Yeah, you're there about. Yes. Yeah, the temperature is there about 20,000 Kelvin. So, the temperature of the arc, if I'll show you in subsequent slides at the central arc column, it will be close to 20,000 Kelvin. Okay? But unfortunately, we do not transfer the heat efficiently because the conduction convection radiation is not that efficient. So therefore, the process is not that efficient. If you can transfer the entire heat of the arc toward the arc piece, okay, so there is nothing like that. I mean, you will have a fantastic, you, you can penetrate 30, 40 mm plate even with 100 amperes current, right? So the efficiency is not there. But the arc is, is, is fantastic. We look at it and what is happening inside. How does the temperature increase as high as 20,000 Kelvin inside the arc? Okay? And before that, we will see again. So if you look at it inside the arc, obviously there are two particles, fundamental particles. What are they? Electrons and ions, that is it. Okay, so, you will have electrons and ions. Of course, you will also have unionized gas atoms. Or if you use diatomic gas, what are diatomic gases? N2, H2, CO2, diatomic gas, you will also have molecules. Okay, so, that is what the fundamental particles are electrons and ions, and with that, we can generate temperatures as high as. 20,000 Kelvin. Okay. So if you look at arc column, it mainly consists of, as I said, neutral particles, neutral atoms, which are not which are yet to be ionized, or neutral molecules yet to be dissociated. Okay. So if you have N2, you will have N2, but N2 will become N. Okay. And then N becomes N plus. N plus further becomes N2 plus, N3 plus until you strip off all the electrons. Okay? And if you have argon, argon becomes argon plus and you generate electrons. Okay? So the R consists of two fundamental particles. Okay? Of course, if you consider uh, the, the uh, light is also a fundamental particle, you also have photons. But in our case, we can assume the two fundamental particles electrons and ions. Okay? So obviously the electrons are negative ions. Okay, it's generally it's negative particles, sometimes you may also have negative ions. Okay? So all the negatively charged particles would move towards 
anode which is positive terminal. The positive ions would move to cathode and during this process they will not go just like that. Okay. So, when you are walking in the corridor you do not collide with someone else then you transfer energy and the other person either fall or you fall because the other person can also transfer energy to you. Okay. So, then you dissipate energy by falling down. Okay. So, that can be pain as well. Okay. But in this case, so when the electrons and ion travel from cathode and anode they also collide. Okay. So, the collision obviously then discharge energy right. So, this collision can be the elastic collision and elastic collision and we can look at lovely mechanism behind these collisions, but we are not going to that detail because it is too much high temperature physics. We will assume now that the ions and electrons in the arc column when they travel towards the anode and cathode they collide each other and they transfer energy, they dissipate energy that energy is released as a heat radiation and various other mechanisms. So, the heat is generated because of the collision when they travel from one end to other end okay. and if you have equal amount of electrons and ions, so then elect our column becomes electrically neutral right. So, then the charge is neutralized in most of the cases in if you have just arc okay, arc is selectively electronegative because you always have more number of electrons than ions okay, always electronegative. But when the number density or the charge density of electrons and ions equal then your arc column becomes electrically neutral that state is known as plasma okay. So, plasma is a state of matter right, when do you call arc a plasma? Yeah, so when arc column becomes electrically neutral then you call that plasma, plasma is a matter is not it. So, plasma is a matter because it is electrically neutral okay. So, at a given unit of volume okay, if you have equal number of positive and negative charges then it becomes electrically neutral. When you have R column electrically neutral then you attain a state plasma. So, if you want to do that then you will have to do lot of things. In a conventional arc generally it is not electrically neutral, I will tell you say R column is electrically neutral. So, when you have a given unit of volume, you have equal number of equal number density of electrons and ions. Then you reach electrical neutrality and system becomes electrically neutral and you reach plasma state. Okay. So, generation of plasma is extremely difficult. Even if you, you can strike an arc okay, to create a plasma, you need to do lot of things. We will see when you look at plasma welding how arc changes into plasma. So, as of now we assume that when arc column becomes electrically neutral when you have equal number of electrons and ions, but generally arc column is electronegative you have more amount of electrons right. So, if you look at uh, temperature in anode fall zone what happens? you have accumulation of electrons okay then the electron temperature will much higher in cathode fall zone ion temperature will be higher whereas in arc column you have thermal equilibrium because the number density is more or less equal so the temperature of electrons and the gas ions would be more or less the same Okay. And apart from electrical neutrality, you will also have a thermal equilibrium. Okay. In our column, because of the equal number density, there will be mutual collisions and then there will be